Let's see. Okay, so, um, hello everyone, and thank you for joining today. Um, I'm Esperanza, the community manager of Focal Plane, uh, the microscopy community site hosted by the Journal of Cell Science. And now, um, back to uh, today's uh, speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce to this speaker, Eva Nogales. Um, she's professor of biochemistry, biophysics, and structural biology, and a Howard Hughes investigator at the University of California, uh, Berkeley. Eva received her uh, bachelor's degree in physics uh, from Universidad Autónoma de Madrid in Spain. Uh, she then moved to the UK, where she worked at um, the synchrotron radiation source um, and earned her PhD in biophysics from the University of Keighley. Um, for her postdoc, she moved to the US and worked with Kenneth Downing at the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory on the structure determination of tubulin by electron um, crystallography. And she actually obtained the first atomic structure uh, of tubulin and the location of the taxol binding site. Um, when we first started planning focal plane features, uh, we wanted to invite the speakers that um, have been making great contributions uh, to the field of microscopy, either on technology development, uh, cell biology, or bioimage analysis. And cryo-EM is one of the techniques that has uh, revolutionized uh, not only the field of structural biology, but also cell biology uh, with modalities such as cryo-ET um, in the recent years. So Eva has been using cryo-EM for many years now uh, to study cytoskeletal self-assembly uh, during cell division and the regulation mechanisms of gen expression. Uh, gen expression. Um, so we couldn't ask for a better speaker uh, to introduce us uh, to the world of cryo-EM. Um, so thank you, Eva, for joining us. And we're looking forward to um, hearing your talk. Uh, so let me now. So that, oops. Thank you, Esperanza. Just checking that you can see my screen. Yeah. Very good. So um, thank you again for giving me this opportunity to talk to this audience uh, with whom I would love to um, interact more during my talk and later on about how CRAOEM has been used in the study of microtubular structure and uh, the study of the associated factors that directly bind to the assembled microtubule. And I'm going to, what I would like to do to, today is to give you just a primer to the principles of CRAOEM use as a structural biology technique, as Esperanza uh, indicated, um, cryo-electron tomography is another modality of cryo-electron microscopy that is used to study um, microtubules and, and other macromolecular assemblies in the context of the cell, but that's not what I will be talking to you about today. Um, I will be giving you a little bit of a historical perspective of both the technique and its application to uh, the study of microtubules, and I will do this with examples from my own lab. We have covered a, a lot of ground over the years, but we are by no means the only lab working on this, there are many excellent labs working on different aspects of microtubule regulation and interactions. Um, and I'm not citing them because it's easier for me to talk about my own lab, but please just be aware uh, uh, that there are many doing fantastic work. So um, a little bit about the technique, as I said, this is, uh, I'm gonna tell you about a, a modality of cryo-electron microscopy where we, we are a structural biologist, where we purify our components um, and we have them on a test tube. And this is what we're gonna be looking at. As a structural biology technique, however, because of the lack of constraints concerning crystallization, we can study molecules as they are uh, in vitro under conditions where they are fully uh, active um, and as large complexes as, as they need to be. So once purified, we put um, a little bit of the solution on uh, an electron microscopy grid. I'm, I'm using some slides generated by uh, Gabe Lander at Scripps um, to illustrate this. <clears throat> and, you know, this is typically three to five uh, microliters. Um, there are now techniques being developed to, start, uh, to use even less, but this is the most common method is to use uh, now um, different kind of instruments to um, take that 
a small um, droplet of water on the ear and green and make it even thinner, make a little uh, very thin film of protein embedded in, in this buffer, typically using filter paper that comes down on the ear and green and just leave this very, very thin layer, uh, which is then very quickly um, plunged into liquid ethane, something, a, a very potent cryogen that gives us freezing rates so fast that the water is vitrified, is frozen in an amorphous state that therefore um, preserves the, the structure, very beautifully the structure of, of the macromolecular assembly. This is an example of how, um, uh, this is a micrograph, an actual micrograph when, at the times when data was being collected on film um, that shows how microtubules look like uh, in a frozen hydrated uh, thin layer. Uh, when imaging the transmission electron microscope. Now, as uh, Esperanza indicated very, uh, you know, in her introduction, during my postdoc with Ken Downing, we use electron crystallography, a method that had been developed at the MRC, especially by Richard Henderson, for which um, he actually got the Nobel Prize just a few years ago. Um, in this methodology, both images and electron diffraction is, uh, are obtained from a crystal that is two-dimensional in nature. So something that extends in a plane, but otherwise is one molecule thing. And we used it in the study of tubulin because as you know, um, tubulin self-assembles into cylinders with a certain polarity, but um, in the presence of zinc, the protofilaments, the linear arrangements of tubulins actually associate in an anti-parallel fashion. And because of this, they don't close, they can, uh, extend in two dimension into something that looks like a two dimensional crystal. It is really just a polymer, an aberrant polymer of tubulin. And it so happened that taxol can also bind to these polymers. And like it does with microtubules, it stabilizes them. So we used it as a tool for both to get a stable sample and ultimately also to get the structure of taxol bound to the micro to the tubulin um, in this in this aberrant polymer. So that's the uh, a structure that we obtained more than uh, 20 years ago, um, and the molecule in yellow is, is Staxol. Now, at the time um, when uh, electron crystallography was at its peak, um, the a study of other assemblies that did not have, they were not crystalline in, in nature, was, um, was a still was progressing. And at the time, the state of the art in the structures of the microtubule were 20 Armstrongs. Um, these were studies done by Ron Milligan at Scripps. So we could take those uh, structures, as you, uh, as you see, the mesh represent the structure of the microtubule and take the electron crystallographic structure of, of, of a protofilament and find a way to dock it inside the density and in doing so get a pseudo-atomic model, you know, just of how we think tubulins are arranged in the microtubule. And surprisingly enough, even though at the time it was only 20 axon, uh, then in, re in retrospect, we now found out the, the prediction of what were the elements that were making lateral contact, what was exposed on the outside of the microtubule, what was on the inside, uh, were really quite correct. In any case, since then, the field of cryo-electron microscopy has really advanced to the point that it's not only possible to stay, obtain um, structures of two-dimensional crystals or of helical polymers like, like the microtubule, but the structures of any macromolecular assembly. Um, so in, in transmission electron microscopy, electrons go through the sample and generate images that are two-dimensional projections, very much like an X-ray if you want, where the X-ray co contain information on everything, say in your head from the nose, the, your nose to the back of your head. Um, the images are very noisy because biological samples are radiation sensitive. So we minimize, we reduce radiation by having them at cryogenic temperatures, but it's still there's damage that is being happening, uh, that is happening. So we have to use very low doses. But then we overcome the limitations of the low signal to noise and the fact that the image is, is a projection through computational analysis. In this analysis, I'll, I'll show you in, in a second, we classify the images onto the different views, then we align them and uh, in plane, we can average them to generate the 2D class averages like the one shown here for the ribosome 
that has enhanced signal to noise. And then we can use images like this from many different directions, identify the relative angles between them and put them together to obtain a final volume. Um, and in doing this, we have not at any point required crystallization of the sample, um, which is um, a necessity for the most commonly used uh, structural biology technique for many years, which is X-ray crystallography. The lack of requirement of crystallization means that we can look at fully assembled complexes, meaning we don't have to break them down to crystallizable units. And we can study them in near physiological conditions, meaning yes, outside of the cell, but otherwise under conditions where microtubules will be undergoing dynamic instability, assembling and disassembly, or where kinesins are taking steps along microtubules, for example. It's also very important that this technique requires extremely small amounts of sample. So um, it is not important for our microtubular studies, um, given that, as many of you may know, you know they are very abundant uh, in the cell and on mammalian brain, where many of us purify them from. Um, but we also study transcription complexes, and we are able to tag um, CRISPR tag endogenous uh, material that is in, in very low copies in the cell and studies uh, still study then by cryoelectron microscopy. Okay, so this technique has been around for a number of years, but really about less than 10 years ago, something revolutionized the field, and this was due to new detector technology, what we call direct electron detectors. I can tell you more about it in the maybe uh, sitting around the table and also new software that has made the, the process that I just described very quickly, very, very robust. And a part, you know, one of the things that um, this has allowed is to uh, study samples that may be a mixture, either conformational or, or compositionally. And um, the methodology, now the quality of the images and the software allows us to um, separate different states and actually get uh, several structures in parallel and because we are not mixing things that are slightly different is actually easier now than ever to get to higher resolution. So I would say most of cry em studies today uh, are obtained in the regime between three and seven angstroms. Some get a stack a little lower, um, some get even better resolution and the absolute state of the art with um, the most powerful equipment and with the best behaved samples uh, now has demonstrated that it can reach a resolution of 1.2 angstroms, really parallel uh, to parallel what can be done uh, in the base cases in, in X-ray crystallography, where you can see individual atoms, you can see hydrogen atoms. So um, in CRYM, the first part, as I, as I mentioned, is to go to from this state in which the sample is in solution to a very thin layer of vitrified buffer with the molecules embedded uh, in them, okay? This is the frozen hydrated state that maintain at liquid nitrogen temperature can go inside the vacuum of the electron microscopes and allow us to visualize the sample in a hydrated state and minimize radiation damage, okay? So in transmission electron microscopy, I mentioned this very quickly, the images that we obtain are projections. There are no surface renditions, they are not single slices, they are projection of the whole structure. Okay, the images, this is a real image now, uh, are fairly noisy. This is particularly good because it's Groyel, a, a very beautiful sample for cryo-electron microscopy. From these images, we select, we, we do what we call particle picking, um, the, the different objects that correspond to, um, to the macromolecule of interest. And now we can use artificial intelligence to do this. Then we go through a process of 2D classification where we put together all the images of the objects that are being seen in a certain orientation. Then we can align them rotationally and translationally and average them out to get these two D class averages that we're telling you now have enhanced um, signal to noise. And if we do this for all possible orientations and then found, find by different means the relative orientation between them, we can put them uh, together um, to obtain a three-dimensional structure. And depending on the amount of data, the heterogeneity or not of the sample, we can get to different resolution. At the time uh, when uh, Gabe generated this, 
um, this animation, this was kind of the state of the art. It's about six angstrom resolution. It's a resolution in which um, the um, you can take uh, atomic models that have been shown here as a ribbon diagram and actually dock them very accurately because alpha helices look like little sausages connected by thinner densities that corresponds to loops. Of course, once you get to higher resolution, I would say four angstroms and better, you can start seeing helices and, as actual helices and see side chains. Um, and that will allow you to generate an ab initio atomic model, which is ultimately the goal in these studies. So, so these, uh, this methodology is what we refer to as single particle methodology. It simply means you don't need a crystal or a helix or anything like that. The methodology can be applied also to polymers like microtubules. This was actually pioneered by uh, Ed Egelman and now has been used for many of us. We can split the microtubule with boxes that do overlap for reasons that I will not get into, deep, but to generate just galleries of particle images that then can be treated just like the images of Groyel of the images of ribosomes. Now, there is a very special circumstance for microtubules because we said that there are helical assemblies, but they're actually not. In, in a microtubule, alpha-beta tubulins, which are represented here in blue and green respectively, associate laterally, and they do it with a certain a stagger and a certain angle that give rise to the cylindrical shape of the microtubule. And you, as you can see, most of these interactions laterally are homotypic in nature. Blue interacts with blue and green interacts with green. But there is one special case um, that we call the seam, which breaks this helical symmetry in which a, a beta tubulin interacts with alpha and alpha interacts with beta. And this is a problem because, because in an electron microscope images where we are not, we don't have green and blue to represent alpha and beta tubulin, it really is very difficult to distinguish alpha and beta tubulin, which are extremely similar to each other. So in reality, it's like we're seeing something like this. Um, how can we do to image and do all these processes of alignment and end up putting the seen from one image in the wrong place with respect to the other and averaging alpha and beta tubulin. Well, now we have methods where we can basically do it um, just relying on the, on the features in the image, but even better is that we can use microtubule associated proteins, say uh, kinesin, uh, motor domain, to bind to the dimer, it binds to the tubulin dimer, it binds a very specific sites. And now it serves as a fiducial, it serves as a marker um, as to the position of a dimer. And this means that now you can use that kinesin, that extra density to do the alignment without uh, averaging um, between alpha and beta tubulin subunits. This is just a technical detail, but this was very important in the development of imaging methods uh, to move resolution of microtubules, uh, make them better. So this, in this image here, you will see an undecorated microtubules. These are microtubules with nothing bound to it. And here are microtubules that have kinesin bound to it. And I hope you can see these knobs. Um, kinesin has been put there in, 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 in large amounts so that every single binding site on the microtubule uh, is occupied by kinesin. In this way, you can obtain the structure of the microtubule and the kinesin bound uh, to it. So when we first applied this type of methods, we were able to obtain a structure of the microtubule that was at around four and a half angstrom. Uh, and that was already very good given the knowledge that we already had of tubulin. But I have to tell you, once we obtain the direct electron detector that I was telling you about, the structure really came to life. The resolutions are now typically around three and a half angstroms, plus or minus half, a, half an angstrom. And at this resolution, the density maps look like ribbon diagrams. You can really see the beta strands, the loops, um, the alpha helices, and there's plenty of information to make a relatively accurate um, uh, model, atomic model of the microtubule. So just to give you some perspective, in 1999, when we worked with Ron Milligan doing this docking, um, uh, the microtubule structure was known to 20 angstrom resolution. Um, the resolution improved by an order of 2 to 10 angstrom, but got stuck there for a number of years. And then using these methods that are uh, hybrid between single particle and using the helical properties of tubulin, um, 
by 2015, we could make that shift to three and a half Anson where we really can do um, some nice atomic modeling. So we went from the crystallographic structure, the original electron crystallography structure, where we needed to collect data both on film and CCD, depending on images and diffraction data, where the resolution was between 3.7 and 4.5. And it was an isotropic in nature. I can tell you more about that if you're interested. But we have to collect data for three years, an average 2 million molecules of tubulin to get to that resolution. Um, and now with the direct detectors, we can get to a better resolution, more isotropic, uh, with much less data, where the data collection uh, at the most takes a couple of days. So big, big improvement. That means that we can study many things now in microtubules. Um, so one of the things that we have studied is how microtubules change with nucleotide state, something that is at the heart of microtubule dynamic instability by studying them bound to both uh, non, non a number of non-hydrolyzable GTP analogs as well as GDP. And more recently, in data that is not published yet, using uh, mutant, uh, hydrolysis mutant of tubulin that cannot hydrolyze. We can also look at drug binding, microtubules are a target for, um, for a number of diseases, but most importantly um, for anti-cancer agents and we've been able to visualize those. Um, so for example, concerning nucleotide hydrolysis, we show how the process of GTP hydrolysis gives rise to what appears to be like a compaction of the microtubule lattice uh, along protofilaments that really relies on a conformational change that happens in alpha tubulin, where um, there is an anchor point that doesn't move, but otherwise there's a domain in alpha tubulin that flexes uh, this is a flexing of about two angstrom, uh, and that's what gives rise to this apparent uh, compaction, which is just the adaptation to that conformational change. And that's something that is relatively small for one dimer, but if you want, it propagates through the whole structure of the microtubule. We could see, on the other hand, that we can look at the lateral contacts uh, between uh, protofilaments, both between alphas and, and, and betas, and we were not able to see any major changes with nucleotide state at this resolution at, at 3.5 angstrom. Um, so changes in the, lat in the longitudinal contacts and the longitudinal compression of U1 of the protofilament, but not, nothing very obvious between lateral contacts, except at the seam. So one of the things that we notice is that the microtubule doesn't have a perfectly circular uh, arrangement of protofilaments. It has one side where the protofilament seems to be apart, like tearing, um, like under tension that it splits them apart. And that happens to be right at the seam where there is these heterologous lateral contacts. And interestingly enough, if you look at something that uh, has a non-hydrolyzable GTP analog, uh, that breaking apart that is marked here by the red color is smaller. It seems like it's the same, but please look at the scale. Um, this is actually half the distance, half of the split that you find at the um, seam of a microtubule that has undergone uh, GTP hydrolysis. Very interestingly, something like EB3, which is a plus uh, uh, tip, a plus end tracking um, protein, um, regularizes the seam, means it brings those two protofilaments closer together, making contacts very similar to what the other makes. And it does that by binding between uh, protofilaments and serving as a wedge that geometrically uh, determines um, the, the, the lateral periodicity and, and angular uh, separation between subunits. So as I, as I told you, we, bound, we looked at the binding of a number of antimitotic drugs Taxol, zampanolide, which also binds to the taxol site, or pelurocyte, which binds a at a completely different site. And at this resolution, the resolutions are getting already better. This was already, you know, four years ago. We can uh, really dock um, approximately the position of the of the drug, so we can start to propose 
possible hydrogen bonds and, and ways in which the molecule is interacting with the protein. Pelurocyte was very interested, is, interested. It, intra, it binds between protofilaments and seem to sta uh, staple one protofilament with respect to, uh, to the other. So we looked at the position of uh, pelurocyte with respect to the seam, and we found that it also binds on the seam. And very interestingly, if we look at the residues that it's interacting with across the interface, those are residues that are conserved between alpha and beta tubulin, and that's why it's able to bind even at the seam. And correspondingly, again, this is a normal microtubule that is not um, stabilized. Once pelurocyte binds, it brings back that interface. It just um, helps uh, holds that seam uh, more stably uh, engaged. And within this is part of how microtubules are stabilized by these drugs. Interestingly, Taxol has a completely different effect. It actually makes um, the lateral contact between protofilaments very flexing. So there's a lot of conformational heterogeneity that exists in these microtubules in spite of the fact that are stabilized. And we think that the, the stabilization method is completely different, is one in which Taxol is promoting a straightening of protofilaments um, and less um, tension, if you want, in lateral contact. So whether the stabilizer bind to the Taxol side and they can make the microtubule more flexible while pelurocyte actually um, stabilizes and gives something, uh, um, rise to something that is, 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 is more rigid. Um, but as the um, title of the talk indicated, the thing that is very exciting is that we can look not just the microtubule, but as many other factors that bind to it. Uh, I'll show you kin uh, kinesin, which we use in our original studies more than anything as a fiducial point uh, for the alignment of tubulin subunits. But of course, many people actually make a living of studying the details of how different kinesins bind to microtubules in different nucleotide states to promote the motility of microtubules. Um, we've studied uh, a number of factors that are important for microtubule dynamics and function. Um, I, did, I already mentioned EB3, which is a plus tip, uh, tracking protein that is able to both sense and alter the conformational state of tubulin that relates to nucleotide. Um, we studied a structural uh, map, PRC2, which actually cross-links uh, microtubules. Um, we've also studied TPEX2, which is a microtubule assembly factor, very important to establish the mitotic spindle, or neuronal maps uh, like tau, which act to both stabilize and also organize microtubule in axons, and when um, misbehave, um, can form, uh, it detaches from microtubules and can form uh, amyloid um, bundles and give rise to neuropathies like Alzheimer's. So in, in cases like this, you know, there are structures that for which there are crystal structures that we can then try to dock into the density, see whether they change in conformation or bind to microtubules. There are others, however, that binds to the microtubule and extended state. In some cases, using parts of the protein that are unstructured and become only stabilized up and binding to the microtubule, and we can generate atomic models now completely the novel of how they interact with the microtubules. That was the case for TPEX2. When it came to something like tau, which binds as a stented coil on the microtubule surface, we use tricks that I won't have time to tell you in detail, but maybe at the, again at the table, that combines Rosetta modeling with the constraints of the EM map to get to atomic ma uh, models that minimize the, uh, the energy of the molecule. And that has been very useful for tau, which we published a few years ago, and more recently for something um, um, not yet published, um, that is MAP7, a MAP that is very important in the regulation of motor activity that recruits and, and affects the binding on, of kinesin 1 uh, in microtubule, on microtubules. So this is what I wanted to tell you. I hope uh, this has opened your curiosity about what it is that CryEM uh, can do. I just want to thank a number of people that have come through my lab and, uh, lab and have contributed to all these studies that I'll show you. So Greg uh, and Gabe actually were the, um, the members of my lab that broke the barrier of the 10 angstrom uh, resolution 
uh, limit that the, the field had faced for many years, implementing new methodology for, uh, for image uh, analysis um, that was then further imp improved by Rui Sang and more recently by uh, Chanling Fang. Um, and they were they worked on the original description of the conformation of changes with nucleotide estate together with Liz. Uh, Liz then um, work on the structure of uh, PRC1 and the structure of the different drugs bound to microtubule with Nisrin and Stewart, as well as obtaining the structure of tau bind to tubulin. Uh, Rui um, described both the structure of EB3 and TPEX2. And then I haven't had a chance to tell you about it, but Lisa worked on the effect of acetylation of microtubular structure, and Ben LaFrance uh, characterized the uh, hydrolysis mutant um, mutants um, in, in and how you know they reflect or not what we have seen with the with the GTP analogs. And uh, Chanling was the one that worked on the MAP seven that I very briefly mentioned. And with this, I would like to. Thank you all for your attention and hope that you have some questions for me. And I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Eva. Um, that was really nice talk. Um, I think, let me see if there are any questions come in. Um, but I guess while we wait for some questions from the attendees, um, I can ask maybe a first question. Um, so um, seeing that the cryo-EM now is like reaching almost like atomic resolution, similar to crystallography, that means that um, crystallography is kind of like a technique that is not going to be in use or it's still something that it depends on the type of proteins or molecules. You might need to use one or another. Yeah, I think it really depends. I think crystallography uh, is a very, very mature field where... Um, there is certain niches of proteins that can be relatively easily uh, crystallized and there are domains, for example, that could be really targeted for drug development and um, crystallography still has, uh, can provide in those cases amazing throughput to study very large ensembles of, of you know, uh, chemicals binding to it. But it is true that I think on the academic world, the most excited, uh, exciting structures are coming at, uh, out of CrowEM. These are structures of large assemblies, um, flexible um, macromolecules, integral membrane proteins. So areas of a study that were really limited and that had faced a, a lot of barriers for, you know, the overexpression that is required to be able to do crystallization trials or that you really mm, where crystallization was not possible due to this flexibility. So I, that's why, you know, mm, most of the structural papers that you see in, in top journals right now tend to be cryogen because th those are systems for which there was a thirst for the structural information that had, you know, basically mm, face the, in, in the impossibility of the of the crystallization but having said that you know uh, I think there is still plenty of things that crystallography is going to be doing as I say super super par uh, powerful automated really really mature but cryem just keeps on improving mm. and now that the community of cryem practitioners has long grown so large they're a fantastic market for further improvements both on the academic world, people that are pushing technological development and software, and from the company point of view that can invest now because they're gonna be able to sell many more systems. So that CryoEM is also moving very fast, is able to do better with flexible molecules, is able to do better with smaller and smaller proteins that before mm. they were like too small to do any image. Uh, averaging and of course the very exciting part that I'm not covering and for a cell biology journalist I feel a bit bad about this uh, but very excited is cry electron tomography and how it can be used in you know very complex reconstituted systems cell extracts or cell directly mm -hmm. um, 
and that will this will be something that will have its, its absolutely unique niche uh, of ultra structure um, in in situ, if you want. Um, okay, we have one question from um, Kaylan. Um, so it's: uh, Do you think is it possible to use cryo EM on native samples of microtubules as a tool to discover uh, novel states or binding proteins? Yeah. So I I imagine that. The question again means native microtubules in the cell. So there, there are a number of labs that have really pioneered the study, uh, the the uh, the study of a structure inside cells. Um, you know, Wolfgang Baumeister is probably um, his lab, and people that have come from from his lab is is probably the the most representative. So there are now many tomograms inside the cell. Microtubules are particularly gorgeous structure, very distinctive to see inside the cell. Um, people have studied to see interesting things, like for example, the very mysterious lumen of the microtubule. Are the things bound to the lumen? Because many of the things that we study uh, in vitro tend to be bound to the outside, and there are. Um, and there is a certain correlation between um, modifications like acetylation and how much of these um, densities is seen inside the microtubule. Now, for identification of new material or, or new microtubule binding proteins, I don't know whether this will be the, the more direct way of doing it because um, electron tomography is still far from having the kind of resolution that we have in in vitro uh, studies. So we can see densities bound to them, but to identify them as something new will be very hard. Something that is very exciting and, and the field that is um, that is linking what can be done by fluorescence microscopy and by electron microscopy is correlative light electron microscopy where one or several um, components of the cell that are of interest to you, so it could be a, a number of maps, can be um, fluorescently labeled, and then your images can be sup of the same sample can be superimposed so that you see the position, you know, or the enrichment of certain um, certain maps on a particular microtubule. To do this well, it still would require more. Uh, technical development. But I think something that is very exciting is our intermediate. Mm. For example, um, people like um, Karsten Janke is, is pushing uh, methods in which um, you can work with extracts that may have been enriched in or depleted of certain modifications that binds to certain maps. You can get those microtubules uh, you can mass spec them to see what you gain or what you lose, and you can also do tomography on those extracts. Um, so that is a way of doing some kind of discovery where you link um, association of enrichment with a certain map and start a structural characterization. This is a long answer because it was a complex question that you were you were asking. Uh, we have another question from uh, Mette Morgenstern. Um, I would like to ask a question about your work on acetylated microtubules. Mm -hmm. uh, microtubules become more flexible and stable. Does the acetylation make EB1 able to bind easier to the lattice or not just the, um, or not just the uh, plastic? Yeah, we, we have not done detailed um, analysis where we compare, you know, we, we get KDs maybe through pelletin, you know, quantitative pelletin assays or anything like that, um, titrating the amount of EB1 for different microtubule types to see whether there are tiny, small differences. I think the differences, the large differences are the binding to different nucleotide state, but in the body of the microtubule, um, I don't think that the differences between acetylated and deacetylated will, will be large enough um, just because um, you know the effect of the asset, the, the local uh, position of the acetylation is very far from where EB3 binds, and the effects um, that have to do with maintaining those lateral contacts in spite of of um, you know bending and things like that, I don't think will have 
a very dramatic effect. But, you know, first we haven't done the actual measurements and then it is amazing how much cooperativity can exist in a polymer where allosteric effects of one binder on one side can have effects that go to all other sites, not just in the molecule, but along the lattice. So it is an interesting question that you are coupling something that has to do with the flexibility and the binding of something between, like EV3 that is able to bind between different subunits and, and is therefore particularly sensitive to any allosteric changes that, that happen. So my instinct tell me very likely the effect is very minimal compared to what EB3 is normally able to, de to detect, um, but the studies have not been done. Um, we have another question from Victoria Alonso. Um, great talk, thank you. Uh, thanks so much. You have studied the impact of tubulin acetylation, again, <laughs> on microtubules. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your take on other post-translational modifications um, mm -hmm. and the hypothesis of a tubulin code? Yeah, yeah, no, very cool. So, so you know, uh, acetylation is, is the only major histone modification that does not occur in the C-terminal tail of alpha and beta tubulin. Um, it, ex it is placed on a loop that is relatively flexible, but is, um, but is close to a position of action, which is a lateral contact. And that's what we say, we think that it has this effect on, uh, on the, the stabilization and the flexibility of that lateral contact. Now, for almost everything else, so most of the other major modifications, exist in the alpha and beta tubulin tails, which are extended unstructured regions of tubulin that basically just um, poke, you know, um, float out on the microtubule surface like, like weeds, uh, if you want, um, uh, in, in that just moving in with the flow in, in, in the sea, if you want. So we know that these regions are very important to the recruitment um, and the retention of microtubule associated proteins, and that they tend to contribute to uh, the affinity of different maps for the microtubule surface. Many of these maps have also a footprint, like all the examples that I showed you, on the stable microtubule lattice, but they're also hooked, if you want, um, with these flexible elements that are very charged, where the charge can be modified through post-translational modification. So we know they contribute to microtubule binding. We know that some of them give a specificity to certain functions and that really contribute um, more to recruit, recruiting one mark versus the other. But they have been visualized in very few occasions because they are flexible in nature and they tend to interact with other flexible elements in the microtubule associated protein. So I know of two cases where the tail has been visualized. In one case, we visualized it uh, when tubulin was bound to the NDC80 kinetochore complex. Um, and in another case that was visualized at even better resolution with better definition, uh, is in, the, in, a, in a study by Antonina Rolmecat bound to one of the modifiers. So when you look at the microtubule, with the modification enzyme that is engaged on the tail in the process of adding that covalent modification, you can see the tail. But in other cases, we have not been able to. So it's a very interesting um, case where uh, these are elements contributing to affinity and uh, avidity, but um, we have very, very little uh, structural information yet um, because we have never been able to visualize it stably bound to a globular region of the map, always the, the flopping around. But um, I think that maybe we have not explored sufficiently uh, the number of maps, and I'm sure some of them, that really depend on those modifications to bind them to the microtubule are probably engaging those cells more tightly and with more specificity and in a more rigid way. And I don't give up on the idea that we will see some of these modifications sometime and get to an idea of how that possible code exists, whether one modification regulates um, the presence of the other and, and so forth, like it happens for, for histone tenants. Yeah. Um, we have another question from um, Isabella Kowalsik. Um, 
fantastic talk and technique. How much cryo EM is applicable in the studies of the dynamics of such structures like primary cilia, but in the context of more complex tissues? Right, right. Um, so, um, so th this is actually an an area of active research by other other labs that are studying, um, you know, axonemes in cilia and flagella, and in some cases start to. You know, I think that right now the studies have been more on defining the overall morphology of these huge, beautiful, uh, very complex assemblies. Um, but now the the question of how motors are acting in these uh, microtubules assemblies to give rise to the wave patterns that allow for you know for motility or for whatever. It it is the next uh, the next frontier, and as I said, these these are Mm, cryo-electron tomography uh, studies um, that uh, that are still on the earliest days uh, concerning pushing um, the technique and the image processing to get more and more resolution. But this is already from studies where, you know, actual beating uh, flagella or cilia have been frozen and the tomography can be happening in the concave and convex parts of, of the structure, uh, comparing it and comparing what kind of molecular engage, engagement are happening around the, you know, the, the arrangement of, of, uh, of doublets that have already led to you know, models, um, testable models that are uh, of how the, the, the beating can happen. And I think now this is going to be happening with say more and more types of flagella that we know have different kind of dynamics for different type of motion and comparing doing this comparative analysis of how all these different um associated proteins but especially the dynings are, are you know are engaged to generate these patterns of motility is coming is 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 one of those things that i think uh we will learn within the, in the next few years you know very active uh area of research not what i do um, but uh, definitely a lot of work is happening. Um, so uh, both um, concerning beating of flagella for motion, but also, uh, you know, cilia, um, intraflagella motility and things like that, um, a lot going on, yeah. Um, I don't think we have more questions, but um, following that, because um, like you mentioned that kind of like the the thing that advanced or like pushed cryo EM lately, it was basically the new detectors and kind of like software and image analysis processing. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. What is next? Is there like something like can be pushed more the detectors or is it more like sample prep? What needs to be or like can be enhanced uh, to get all these samples that you were mentioning? Yeah, all of the above, um, although I think the sample prep is by far the area mm. um, that needs the most development. So detectors are going to get better. Um, so I don't know if we are in version 2.1 or something like that. There's a lot, many more versions that will come that will make detectors better. They will make them larger. They will make them faster in the recording. And, and keep improving um, the you know quantum efficiency at all frequencies and things like that. Um, so the detectors are going to get better. The microscopes are getting better, typically at, at a terrible dollar cost. Um, <laughs> so there are microscope microscopes that are really truly a state of the art that go for you know ten million dollars a pop, and I think those should be. Um, really make difference for the best samples where what is limiting is not the sample itself, but how far the optics of the microscope can take you. Those are the samples that potentially can get to 1.2 angstrom um, resolution. And I think those should go into national facilities and things like that. Um, hopefully we, we get a number of them here in, in the US soon. Um, but I think, you know, major thing has to do with sample preparation both for single particles, so the kind of a structural biology, atomic resolution kind of structures, and also for electron tomography to describe in more and more detail the ultrastructure in cells. So the, for the first one, it has to do with the fact that 
I was trivializing the fact that you get from a volume to a very thin film of vitrified water. That the, the time that the molecule is in that film before it gets frozen is really dangerous because the molecule is still diffusing and it touches an air water interface. And one is that, that, that is an infinite hydrophobic sink. It's a hydrophobic surface. So a protein touches it and it could even unfold. It could be trapped in and unfolded straight and then aggregated and things like that. So it, the, the structures that you get are the ones that were able to overcome that problem using some kind of surfactant that work for the particular protein, using some cross-linking, mild cross-linking that stabilize the complex so it does not allow it to fluctuate into unfolded states, or um, substrate, so something that you put on the EN grid that the molecule can absorb too, that it likes and that it stops it from diffusing and touching the air water in the same interface as the field is being thing. A lot has to be done to find a universal solution but if it is found, then we will get the whole structure of the proteome in a few years, hmm. literally. Now, for the other one, for the cell, the problem is we also need thin samples to do transmission electron microscopy. So you have to freeze the, the, the cell, and then you have to cut a thin layer. So cryosectioning is super difficult. People have been trying to do this for, you know, since I was young, so a long time ago. Um, the solution that seems to work best these days is what is called focus ion beam milling, where the, the frozen sample is then bombarded with, you know, some helium, for example, ion beam, uh, high energy ion beam that basically removes layers and if you do it with the right geometry, you basically can generate a lamella of whatever thickness you want, you know, 200 uh, nanometers, for example. And that's what is visualized. That is super difficult to make. Um, there are so many steps that can go wrong. Hmm. If you studied something where it doesn't matter, you cut a section and you will get what you want, fine. But imagine that you want something very specific, you have to use some kind of correlative light microscopy to make sure that you mill the section, that you end up with the part where the occurrence that you're interested in is being visualized. And, and that is still in its infancy. A, few, a, a number of labs are, are making tremendous contribution, getting all of us very, very exciting. But that part that has to do with the preparation of these lamellas Mm. Uh, exactly on the place that you want to be able to do this correlation of light microscopy, hopefully one day super resolution cryo light microscopy and your cryo EM will be amazing. And there will be a lot of cell biology that gets um, developed in the process. So that's the major, to me, major area of development um, is in sample preparation. Right mm -hmm. now is is just in a few labs around the world. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, let me see if we have more questions. I don't think so. Um, but I think um, since there are no more questions, probably uh, we can leave it for the more like um, interactive discussion later um, on the table. So um, for those that are not staying, so thank you, Eva, for the great talk again. Uh, thank you. All the attendees for the discussion. Um, now, again, like as I said, we're going to move to the remote conference room. So if you're staying, you will find yourself sitting at a table. So just like freely move around and join um, Eva's table. Um, remember it's in the first floor. Um, and then for those of you living, remember to close the, the window. Otherwise you probably are gonna be appearing also on the tables. Uh, so thank you all for joining and we'll see you hopefully on um, the tables. <laughs>